couple of places. So I want to say hello to all of our uh, internet watchers. Uh, I also want to say, because some people have asked, that we approached every campaign. Uh, and, and while I uh, respect all of the campaigns and we work with them closely, I do want to just sort of lay out quickly the reason that we picked this early time, uh, which, which ever, anyone who knows me, we would never have an 8 a.m. morning uh, if there wa uh, event if there wasn't a reason, uh, was uh, that, that Mitt Romney's campaign was very interested in, in participating, and this was the only time uh, at that point that they could participate. Uh, as it turned out, the people that they had hoped to have here uh, today uh, uh, were not able to be here. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, I want to say that, that uh, a very good guy, Craig England, who is uh, an economic advisor to Mike Huckabee, worked very hard to reshuffle his schedule yesterday and be here. We put him on our program as invited. As it turned out, we learned a short while ago um, that he will not be able to be here. Uh, but all the other campaigns were contacted, and Ron Paul's people kept saying they're sending someone, and I figured we can take out Mike Huckabee and put in Ron Paul if they're here somewhere. Let me know. Uh, just, just bring ID. <laughs> Um, they but, don't believe but, in a national. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a little bit of a pun there. Uh, I want to to also uh, just just thank uh, our our good friend Leo Hendry because Leo um, is really doing. They um, several of these people up on the on the panel spoke last night for the Council on Foreign Relations. Leo said he would be here today and happy to do something, and really gave us the hook on which to begin this. He's giving a, a hearing on foreign assistance uh, programs outside of the the the. Uh, arena that we're discussing this more for the House Appropriations Subcommittee on State Foreign Operations. Uh, and there are other people, Larry Wilkerson, Colin Powell's Chief of Staff is here with us today talking about different directions for Iraq uh, in, the, uh, in the House uh, uh, Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. So a lot of cool people here this morning and it's great to be with all of you. Well, I thought it would be useful, given the, the, the star cast that we have here, is to ask some of the economic advisors to lay out in, in five to six minutes the chief features uh, of their candidates' economic ideas. And sometimes I think there's an artificial attempt to sort of ask everyone to say, okay, let's talk about international trade, or let's talk about finance, or let's talk about what's going on in the markets, let's talk about domestic stimulus, let's talk about uh, what would you do for the, for the, for the, for the working Joe, et cetera. And, and what I think is that each of the candidacies is, and candidates is bringing a slightly different set of features and to some, somehow try to create one sort of horizontal look creates an art, you know, I think an artificial uh, imposition. I'd like to hear very much from, from these advisors and from the campaigns about how they see uh, their highest priorities given the times we're in. Clearly, uh, this is a fragile time in the world economically, or at least people think it is given what we have seen in the markets and given the uh, reaction to the Federal Reserve yesterday. And with us, we just have an outstanding group of of economic minds here today, regardless of whether they were uh, advising presidential campaigns. To my right is Austin Goolsbee, uh, who is, of course, senior economic advisor to Barack Obama uh, for president. He's the Robert P. Gwynn Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business, and he's got a great website with all of his articles up there. Very surprising stuff, and I recommend that folks take a look at it. We then have, to his right, Leo Hendry, who's senior economic advisor to John Edwards uh, for his campaign. He's managing director of Intermedia Partners. LP. In 2005, he won Le Mans, uh, kind of a, a cool accomplishment, uh, and, and one of the great cable kings uh, in, in the United States and, and, and sports uh, uh, media kings. Uh, to his right, we have Kevin Hassett, uh, senior advisor to John McCain uh, for president, director of economic policy studies and resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and still optimistic about the markets, I understand. Um, and then we have Gary Gensler. Uh, Gary and I uh, have just gotten to know each other off the phone. I, I really, in, in the last few days, but I know his reputation. He is an uh, 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 economic policy advisor uh, for Hillary Clinton uh, for president, former undersecretary of the Treasury for domestic finance, and former assistant secretary of the Treasury for financial markets. So we really have an outstanding cast uh, with us this morning. I'm going to ask Austin Goolsby to take the uh, town first, ask speakers to come to the podium, speak to five to six minutes. I'm a savage moderator, so if anyone goes too, too far, over, I, stand up. Yeah, I want you to stand up. Oh. We'll, we'll have a discussion down there, but uh, come join us here. It'll be good for the cameras and good for your candidate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so please give Austin Goolsby a, a, our welcome. Okay, this is a little more formal than I had anticipated, and we, Leo and I have been uh, doing some of these. We've been down in the scrum many times. Okay, um, as an overview, uh, I would say if the past of these is any guide, you are likely to find that the Democrats are 
in many ways pretty close to one another. There are distinctions, but they're a little subtle, and there's a wide gulf between where all the Democrats are and where essentially any of the Republicans are. So it will be interesting to see um, to see how that plays out. I'd say for Senator Obama, the, the investments in the long-run economy, there are few people who are bigger bulls, if you want to think of it that way, in the long run about America and about the American economy, that if we make the investments we need to in our educational system, in an energy policy, uh, in technology, things of that nature, we can maintain our place as the richest, most productive country in the world. I think in each of these areas, if you look at what has happened the last six years, uh, it hasn't been a great, uh, it hasn't been a great lesson for the country. Um, there are wide holes in um, many of those policies where people are falling through the cracks, and we have, in the views of the senator, lost a little bit of balance um, that may have existed through time in America, where what characterizes, let's say, the 40 or 50 years following World War II is we're all in this together, and then in the last six years, more of a where's mine kind of a mentality. Um, and so he would change that. But at the same time, we need to identify a couple of features that have begun to develop that are a bit disturbing, and we ought to address them. And when we address them, we ought to recognize that they play directly into the short-run turmoil and the short-run fears in the economy are rooted in longer-term problems that, that we haven't faced up to. A deteriorating, inadequate health care system for millions of Americans, not just for people who aren't insured, but for people who have insurance and the cost is, is unbelievably high. Uh, second, college less affordable, preparation for college deteriorating in the, at the K through 12 level. And if you look at the income distribution, unlike what existed in America for a long period of time where the top was growing rapidly, yes, but the middle was also growing at a very healthy rate, you've seen in the last six to ten years the bottom 75 percent or so of the distribution with incomes basically stagnant. So the top continues to grow very rapidly, but now the typical worker has really not seen their income grow hardly at all. And while that has been true, the cost of energy, the cost of health care, the cost of college, all of those things rising. That explains, in the view of Senator Obama, why the personal savings rate fell to literally below zero in several of the last years, that if you added up all the personal savings in the country, it was less than nothing. And it's because there's no margin for error. Now, when there's no margin for error, you know what's going to happen when there's something like a house price downturn. There's going to be a huge problem of consumer debt. That starts where the rubber hits the road in places like subprime mortgages. But the mortgage crisis is ultimately a crisis that people didn't have the savings. It is ultimately rooted in this problem of middle class, economic anxiety, lack of savings, etc. To address these issues, Senator Obama thinks that in the short run, we need middle class tax relief, and he has a significant package. And in the long run, we need investing in technology, the industries of tomorrow, and the education system. Uh, that said, it's clear that the economy has taken a very sour turn in recent months. And so Senator Obama introduced what, if you read this morning's Washington Post, it has been widely acknowledged as the most superior of the fiscal stimulus programs that would get all the money out the door and into the hands of the people who will spend it. Um, and I am not just touting it. You can read it for yourself. It is. Uh, it is, I believe, what we need. Normally, we would rely on the Fed um, to be the most nimble. But if you look at the credit markets as they exist now, I think a lot of people believe that the Fed alone is going to have a hard time um, dealing with this slowdown on their own. 
But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this short run souring has blossomed in this negative way. Blossoming is a weird word to use for it, but it has it is the direct result of some specific policy actions that we've taken over the last six years or actions that we have decided not to take. Um, and Senator Obama would change that. And the last subtle, somewhat subtle difference I would point out among the Democratic candidates is that in many areas, if you look at the policies of Senator Obama versus the other Democratic candidates, Senator Obama's has been tried to fit into what you might, what, what he has called an, an iPod version of government, where it's sleek and easy to use, and it's not highly targeted, it's not, it's not designed for the wonks. I know everyone in this room is, darn, we want it to be wonky. It's so, in savings, the centerpiece of his uh, effort to increase savings of low and middle income Americans who don't have accounts is not targeted savings tax credits, which the evidence shows are somewhat effective but not very effective at getting people to start accounts, but instead things like automatic defaulting in enrollment. So if you are a worker, if you do nothing, you would automatically have 3% of payroll deposited into the account. If you don't want that, you can go down and fill out a form that says, please don't. But if you do nothing, it starts the account. And the, the research is very clear that that's the way to get people to start accounts and to begin savings. So that is a subtle distinction. As I say, all the Democrats, I, I believe, are on the same page to, get, uh, to, to address a lot of these issues. They have slightly different approaches. Um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. Great, Austin. Thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to invite Leo Hendry to share his views up here. Thank you, and I, I too appreciate uh, New America's uh, generosity in letting us do this. Uh, my perspective on behalf of, of Senator Edwards, really, there is some contrast with what Austin just described for Senator Obama. John Edwards feels somewhat like Paul Revere in search of a horse. Uh, the, the moment of, of the crisis of today is, is simply evidence of issues that were being addressed by Senator Edwards when he entered this campaign over a year ago. And really, they date back to his entry into the Senate uh, back in 1998-99. We look back and say this is not a crisis of, of non or poor government over the last six years, although that is clearly the case. But these are outcomes that began a quarter of a century ago. And, and no one should feign surprise that we are where we are. Uh, the report card on this society, not only its economy, but on society, is a series of failing grades except for one. And that one is the enrichment of the very top of, of society. And John Edwards has an education plan. It was, it was a pinnacle of his platform. We cannot educate ourselves out of this crisis. John Edwards has an investment plan. We cannot invest our way out of this crisis. John Edwards has an energy plan. And most notably, he was the first of the candidates to have a, a universal health care plan. None of those either are going to get us out of this predicament. We have a circumstance now where we have a massive, massive credit crisis. It, it is so unfair to put this on the backs or on the names of women and men of lesser means and call it a subprime crisis. Uh, we have a pervasive, nationwide, increasingly global credit crisis that is mortgages, credit cards, home equity lines, corporate borrowings. We have a dollar at, at, a, at a virtual low in a historical context. We have $100 oil. Uh, we have trade balances that have, are, are perpetually in deficit, current account deficits. And, and you cannot look at this and say, although we also have a stimulus plan, it may not be the most superior, but it's superior. And, and we have a stimulus plan. John put one forward that was exhaustive and we think responsive to the concerns. But you have a circumstance in the United States today where it's, it's not 75% of Americans that have found themselves living in stagnant conditions economically. The number is closer to 
the wealth in this country has accreted to the top 10 percent to the top 2 percent in unprecedented fashion. We began to assess this issue back in 1928 before the Depression. We now have the most unequal economy in, in, in an income sense since 1928. So that there, there's a lot at risk here and, and there's also a lot at stake here. And the answer is a, an amalgam, sort of a tapestry, as John Edwards has tried to convey, of addressing the things that, that Austin has spoken about and I've tried to reiterate, health care, <coughs> education, investment. But the, the piece of this puzzle that we have to get our hands around is globalization. And it, it, if we walk around this room and say, what do you mean by globalization, the tragedy is none of us share a common definition. So it's quite unfair when, when you hear our concerns about globalization to say that we're anti-globalization because our definition of globalization differs. The trade issues in this country are driving our economy in unprecedented fashion downward. And that doesn't make you an anti-free trader to say that. What it does suggest, in John Edwards' opinion, is, is a mandate, an imperative, that we look at trade as a fairness issue, just like we look at income and taxes and corporate taxes and environmental practices and health care practices and certainly education practices as a fundamental fairness issue. And, and all that John Edwards has been trying to say for a year, and, and the last several days it is important because of a contrast that it draws, as Austin says, with how we as a party approach the economy and our colleagues on the Republican side approach it. And we should talk about that in just a moment. But what we have to do is get common definitions and understand if we as a nation are comfortable with this myriad array of failing grades. If any of us are honest with each other, what part of this society and this economy can we take pride in today? And John Edwards has been trying to raise that issue for a year now. On the issue of stimulus, when, when uh, Austin and I and, and Gary last evening were at the Council on Foreign Relations in a, in a similar kind of event, when it was proffered about 10 days ago, we were, I was trying to look at, at our stimulus initiatives versus the, those of the Republicans. There were none. So in the last 48 hours, 72 hours, there are some. But I think on that single issue, I would, I would make the case that our <coughs> stimulus Gary's on behalf of, of Senator Clinton, Austin on behalf of Senator Obama, and myself on behalf of Senator Edwards, is genuine stimulus. Uh, it, they're all superior. We have to be careful as we look at this, this stimulus issue over the next several days and, and weeks that we don't try to, to take long-term plans, which seem to be the Republican solution, and call that stimulus. This economy needs a kick in the pants and it needs it right now. It needs it in a way that will excite the consumer crisis of confidence and of credit that exists in, in this country today. And it won't be done with palliative checks. So I would close on saying that Senator Edwards looks at the stimulus as he has looked at this entire economy over the past year, and he says that I need to do fundamental change there is a role for government in this economy that has been ignored and, and, and uh, obscured, not just in the last six years, but really dating back a quarter of a century. There is an appropriate, proper role for government to assess and address the kinds of concerns that we've talked about today. I appreciate it, Steve, a lot. I think this will be a great fun, and uh, I thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you, Leo. We'll come back to those issues, I'm sure. I just want to take a quick moment uh, before inviting Kevin up to uh, uh, really say thank you to Steve Muffson, Doug Rediger, uh, uh, Katya Gloker, many of my friends standing uh, on the aisles, which the cameras can't see, but there are a huge number of people standing, and I am grateful, and I owe you all one. It'll take me a while to repay. Please help me uh, welcome Kevin Hassett. Uh, thank thanks uh, very much, Steve. Uh, I, I think we, we all... Uh, would have to admit that the New America Foundation has just done a terrific job uh, bringing a new voice to Washington. I can say that the McCain campaign's uh, idea cabinet would be half empty if it weren't for the New America Foundation, uh, uh, Maya McGinnis uh, in, in particular. 
Uh, I'd also uh, like to say that it's a real great pleasure uh, to be up here with, uh, with Gary and, and Austin, who are old friends, and, and Leo, who uh, I, I'm kind of rooting for Edwards now because I know at least we'll get higher speed limits uh, <laughs> if uh, Edwards wins. Uh, in, in fact, Austin and I uh, first met when Austin was, was in graduate school and he was working on uh, a critique of one of my papers, I think, or, or at least a, a different way of looking at it. Uh, and, I, and I remember emailing him data probably in his second or third year in graduate school. Um, and so it's, it's been a long and, and very positive uh, and, and collegial relationship. And, and uh, Gary and I have uh, represented different candidates over the years and been on panels uh, like this uh, back uh, back when we still looked young, <laughs> I guess. Um, I, I think that, that the fact that we're in a place like New America Foundation and up here on a panel uh, with such old friends is, is kind of important uh, as we think about where we are as a nation and where, where we're going. Uh, I, I think that uh, there was a kind of signal event uh, last last week that is something that we're going to all have to start to get used to. And um, it gave us a glimpse of the bigger picture problem that we're all uh, potentially going to be facing, regardless of who wins uh, uh, next year. And it was last uh, Friday when uh, the president uh, significantly altered his uh, speech about his stimulus plan uh, in uh, making concessions uh, to congressional Democrats to not put details in so that they could work them all out. Uh, and, uh, and the market more or less panicked uh, in, in response to that, um, having received something of a glimpse of the stimulus plan that might, might come. And you can say, well, why is it uh, that that kind of uh, discipline from the market, that kind of panic from the market, uh, entered uh, at this time? And, and, I, and I think that, that there's something big and important going on in, in the background that's bigger than just this recession. And, and, and it's this. Uh, I've, I've been on panels with Gary and, and uh, talked with Austin o over the years. And, uh, and someone would present an academic paper, maybe at the NBER in Cambridge or someplace else, uh, that would say that, geez, you know, our, our system, our fiscal system is absolutely broken. And then there are lots of different ways that we could be broken. Uh, you could look at the tax code and talk about how far it is from a rational tax code. Mm -hmm. You could talk about entitlements and, and, and add up how, how short they are, they are how, how little money we have. And, and, and uh, it, usually when you have these conversations, you end up with something of a puzzle, and the puzzle goes about like this. If you add up uh, all the promises that we made and uh, the revenue that we have coming in uh, for uh, Medicare and Social Security and so on, then you'll see that we're maybe 50 or $60 trillion short, uh, which, which is a lot, a lot of money. Um, and uh, and, and the, the puzzle is, geez, if the U.S. government is 50 or $60 trillion short, why is it that you know, people are still buying our bonds were, you know, all the capital in the world seems to be flowing to the U.S. and we can run this big, big trade deficit and so on. How can it be if, if we've basically got an unsustainable fiscal path? And the only real answer to that question is that uh, markets think sort of like uh, uh, the people in, in Shakespeare in Love uh, who, who thought that somehow it was going to work out. It's a mystery, but the show always, always works out. They think that somehow it's a mystery. It's going to work out before uh, the U.S. fiscal uh, train uh, wrecks. Uh, someone is, go is going to fix, fix it. And um, if you look at the dynamics of American politics and think about when big fixes happen, well, they generally happen around presidential elections. Uh, and uh, very often, uh, the, the best time to get any kind of a change outside of a, a dramatic crisis is in the first year uh, of a new president, the first term of a new president. Uh, that's when someone arrives with a mandate. They had a, a campaign where they said that they were going to do things and so on. Now, if you, if you examine the aging problem of the United States, you'd have to say that uh, what that means is that the next president, uh, a, a year from now, uh, is going to have to deliver. Uh, because if we don't fix our problem soon, if we don't take steps in the direction of restoring the sanity uh, to American fiscal policy, if we don't uh, fix the long-run problems, then uh, the markets are going to, are going to potentially pun punish us severely uh, for that because uh, as, as we age, it's going to be harder and harder. Uh, people will have had less time to prepare for whatever solutions uh, that we might propose. So, so against that backdrop, it's extremely important to remember that uh, we've got long-run problems that we have to fix. Uh, and the, the pressure on whoever it is uh, that is elected to fix them, uh, it could be a lot like what we saw last Friday. Uh, that when, when markets re really start to think and, and the world's investors really start to think, well, geez, the U.S. is, is a house that's in disorder and they can't seem to do anything about it. 
uh, then uh, it, it could get, get very bad. And I think that that's why uh, I'm actually quite optimistic about, uh, about the country uh, and, and about our fiscal future, because I think that, that, that I've, as I've watched the, the Democrats uh, on the campaign trail and, and uh, also interacted with my friends on the Republican side, I think that there's a sense of collegiality and seriousness on the policy teams that I haven't felt uh, in, in uh, politics in a long time. Uh, and, and indeed, you could go to any of the websites of the candidates represented here and look at the many detailed uh, policy uh, proposals that they have and see that, that, that people are taking policy a lot more seriously than they have often in the past, and it's because people recognize this. It, now, against that backdrop, I, I think that, that it's very important to recognize that uh, if, if we enter a, a time, at which we are now, where there's economic weakness, that it's, it's important as an economist, uh, as a policy person, and as a candidate to think about, well, why are we entering those bad times and what can we do uh, to fix it? And um, I think that, that if, if you had your choice, if you could pick uh, two, between two economies, one economy has an absolutely ideal uh, tax system and, uh, I don't know, balanced budget amendment. You could think of uh, fiscal sanity uh, in the extreme. Uh, and it's entering a recession. And then another uh, economy that has an absolutely crazy tax code that's, that's economically indefensible uh, and, uh, and it's entering a recession, then which economy would you choose? Which would you rather have? Well, well, well paradoxically or oddly, you'd rather have the one with, with the cruddy tax code uh, because there's so much opportunity uh, for policy to make a difference. Uh, and, 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 so, and so as we enter this, this stimulus debate, I think it's interesting to ask yourself, well, well, well if, if we were to sit at the NBER and the tax group and list all the things that were wrong in the economy, then we'd have a, a whole long list of things uh, along with the tax code uh, that, that we could fix. And then you'd have to ask yourself, well, well why, why is it that we're not fixing those? Why is it that the stimulus plans that, that are being offered uh, are more or less uh, uh, you could be car caricatured as, as borrowing money uh, from the Chinese that we can drop out of helicopters. Uh, now, how, how is that going to, to really fix the long-run problems of our nation? Well, I would argue that, that, that it probably isn't the right thing to do. And that's what Senator uh, McCain, I think, firmly believes. And so, so his view on stimulus is tied into his view that we have to start taking uh, steps in the direction of fixing our long-run problems. And it is that, that we uh, should uh, basically uh, try to restore the competitiveness of U.S. corporations. I think that Austin rightly uh, pointed out that, that one of the biggest concerns that, that we economists should all have is that, uh, that middle-income people haven't seen uh, their wages grow uh, at the same rate as people at the top. Uh, I, I believe, uh, and I think Senator McCain believes, that one of the main reasons that that's true is that we've created a, a system that is, has more or less stacked the dank deck against companies that decide to expand operations uh, and invest in the U.S. Um, we've uh, allowed people to invest abroad uh, in countries with low tax rates and defer U.S. tax until they mail the money home. Uh, and uh, at the U.S., if they, if they invest at home, then we apply what's essentially uh, within a, a couple of tenths of the <coughs> highest corporate tax uh, in, in the world. Uh, and, and, so, and so if you were a state and, and you were finding that plants were fleeing your state because your taxes were higher than every other state, then you'd know what to do. Uh, similarly, uh, if, if right now the problem is uh, that we're, we're uh, systematically uh, losing our competitive edge, then, you know, there, there are lots of reasons for that. Uh, and, and I think a big one is, is and it's very clear in the literature, uh, that we're, we're a place that's not a friendly tax place for firms to operate. Now, uh, I, I think that, that as we move forward, uh, you're, you're going to see that, that a lot of uh, folks, fair-minded folks who, who care, care about the U.S. have noticed the same thing. I think uh, Charlie, Charlie Ringel, uh, in, in his uh, mother of all uh, tax reforms uh, last year, uh, he also proposed a reduction in the corporate rate. Uh, John Kerry, uh, in 2004, uh, when he had put together his uh, tax plan, uh, he, he suggested a cut. Uh, in the corporate rate. I think that there's wide agreement now, it's not a partisan issue, that we need to take a step in that direction of helping our firms be more competitive, not because we want to help firms, but because we want to help people. And uh, I think Senator McCain on, on the campaign trail right now is, show, is showing a lot more leadership uh, on, on these issues uh, than some of the other candidates. Uh, because I, I think he's doing it 
uh, as he does with all things, not, not because he wants to take short-term uh, political advantage uh, and, and try to get uh, some permanent thing done, you know, trick America into doing something that they shouldn't do, uh, but, but rather uh, because he, he recognizes that we don't have a lot of time uh, and we have a lot of problems that we have to fix uh, and we shouldn't squander opportunities that we have uh, to fix them. And so with that, I thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Kevin, thank you. Before uh, Gary comes here, I just want to sort of note uh, both with Austin's talk about uh, our desire for wonkery, which is absolutely true. Uh, uh, Kevin just made a kind of interesting proposal, if you listen very carefully, which was to sort of, a, I think, a call almost for debate, debates among uh, the wonks, uh, you know, in discussions like this, because I think it's been so much more revealing in some way than some of the debates we've had. So I'll, since CNN and some of the other cameras are here, I'll, I'll call for the, you know, at least for the next round of uh, uh, campaigns that we think about working uh, uh, to bring some of the uh, campaign advisors more into the debate process. Could be fun. Um, Gary Gensler, please hope welcome Gary Gensler. Uh, thank you. It's a, it's a real honor to be here in the New America Foundation. It's a real privilege to work for Senator uh, Hillary Clinton on her campaign. Um, I, I'm going to try to keep it brief because I know you all have questions and just address three things. One is just how uh, Senator Clinton really looks at uh, economic, uh, her, her economic agenda and how she formulates policy. Two, a little bit about the long-term uh, solutions that she's looking at and then very critically to the short-term uh, issues that we have. Um, Hillary's really out uh, on the campaign trail, as she has been as a senator and a first lady before that, listening to Americans. And what she's found is there's somewhat of a disconnect between the policy debates here in Washington and out on the uh, uh, trail. Um, and what she's heard for, for many months, and I think Austin referred to this too a bit, is that Americans really are having challenges, and particularly middle-income Americans. Uh, sh all, all that we discuss with her on the campaign seems to be rooted in her sort of fundamental as to how do we strengthen the middle-income Americans, how do we make sure that uh, we reverse some of what we've seen in the last six or seven years where Americans have lost in the middle, uh, the median income or the typical family is down about $1,000 of income, and yet health care costs have doubled, uh, education costs are up dramatically, oil uh, and, and energy costs are up dr dramatically, um, and uh, as she refers to us of, often, too often, these people are invisible to Washington and they're one pink slip away from uh, 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 having challenges or as even Austin referred to as to a zero savings rate. Um, so it's all within that framework of how, how she uh, helps middle income Americans uh, move forward. Um, she's a fundamental optimist when we present programs to her. Uh, she believes in America that we can solve problems and that we have to take on these great challenges of health care and education and savings rates and competitiveness and an innovation strategy. So a lot of her long-term solutions are around this optimism that we can, we can actually move forward. And so she has comprehensive programs uh, that uh, we could have full panels in each one of these, but on health care, that there really is universal health care for all Americans. And, and that's critical for the economy as well as a moral issue for Americans that we address our education needs and have something strong to make sure that all Americans can have a shot to get to a college and, and have some college affordability, but we start all the way down with the youngest amongst us in the pre-K programs where it really fundamentally makes a difference and moves Americans forward. Um, that we have a savings program, and though Austin said there's some subtle differences that we can debate about uh, uh, research, that she believes that we have to uh, motivate and give uh, incentives to businesses to create more savings for uh, more savings accounts for Americans and more opportunities for Americans to save. Um, energy policy critical not only for the economy uh, but also for energy s security. That we've got uh, uh, right now we're running about close to $900 billion trade deficits a year. Um, how can we expect to bring that down if we don't get energy security and really fundamentally um, uh, have more dependence on our, our natural resources here? And that means more green jobs and also uh, promoting alternatives to uses of oil. Um, 
there, there, in all of these cases, she's laid out programs and she's been committed to uh, fiscal discipline. It's tough working on a campaign with a candidate who is as thorough and as thoughtful as Hillary Clinton, but she has made sure that each one of the proposals that she's put forward has a specific and, and, and clearly uh, detailed uh, uh, way to pay for it. Uh, I mean, sometimes not rolling out a strategy, and in campaigns you want to roll out strategies, and sometimes you have to hold back on that. We respect some other candidates who might not have that same approach, but, but that's the approach that she's tried to, to take. But she also recognizes there's some very critical short-term uh, problems in this economy. And that's why last March and followed in August and October and, and then again in December when she went to Wall Street, she's laid out very specific programs on the housing side. When she's been traveling around this country, she feels that fundamentally so many Americans are hit by this. And I think I agree with uh, what was said earlier, and I know she does. It's not just subprime. Um, that's a critical problem. And uh, there were 2 million foreclosure filings last year. Uh, and so many of the individuals that enter into subprime mortgages have these adjustable rate mortgages. Many people in this room may have them too, but I suspect in this room are a little bit more able to take the shocks of those uh, increasing interest rates. Uh, that, that we really should have uh, a moratorium for a short while, a voluntary moratorium, but she went to Wall Street on December 5th and really challenged them to try to think about how do we smooth this out and allow some time but in addition, a need for fiscal stimulus. Uh, there's a great debate about uh, uh, how, how fiscal stimulus works, uh, that it be immediate and quick acting, uh, but it be temporary. Uh, her total program of about $110 billion, uh, again, very driven by uh, Senator Clinton herself uh, with a group of policy advisors, of course, uh, but around the issues that she's been hearing on the campaign trail, housing, energy, and jobs. Uh, to, to help promote and, and be specific to those uh, three areas. Um, uh, we're glad to see that uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans might actually be coming together on something. We'll watch uh, and, and, and wait to see what actually comes out of these negotiations now. Uh, but she uh, feels strongly that, that she, we, we need it. Uh, she was out there in December calling for it, and more specifically in the last 10 days. Um, with that, Steve, I thought I'd just hand it back so you can do Q&A and uh, uh, have some fun here. <laughs> Gary, thank you very, very much. I think it's been a very stimulating uh, uh, morning. I was just thinking that today, uh, well, I, I want to be very respectful of our good friend Klaus Schwab and Davos, but I was basically to say, who needs Davos with this kind of room that we have here today? Because uh, I know it's beginning today in, in uh, in uh, Switzerland. And as, as uh, uh, Josh Gottbaum told me, he says, it's Davos, not Davos. And I said, I was born in Oklahoma. So uh, uh, let me open the floor. I was going to pose some questions. And I guess I'm going to pose a comment, which, which you know, I think that this, we have got a lot of uh, uh, people here today. So let me set some ground rules. One, if you'd pick one of the three questions you have. Two, give me some latitude in directing who responds to it as best I can. Three, I'm going to ask our responders to be as brief as possible so that we can include as many people. And I need to repeat the questions because we have about 100 people watching the TV in an overflow room over there, and they won't hear the question unless I repeat it. So uh, we'll do it. Why don't I start here, and, and then we'll uh, uh, work, work through the Can crowd. You stand up? Yes, please. <laughs> you don't need a microphone. No. Uh, with the... If you'll uh, identify yourself. With the hundred, uh, Anton Chaitkin, EIR. With 100 to 200 or uncountable trillions of uh, debts and, and uh, hedge fund junk out there, claims against the economy. Do you throw a wall of money at it like Weimar Germany? Do so, you, do you, I don't do like it, the sound right, of the beginning right, of that. Or do you, do you cut it like, like uh, with, with an axe like Mussolini? Or do you do, <laughs> like FDR? He's yeah. all the choices. This is yeah. the other thing for the Democrats. No, no. Do you do like FDR? And, we can put, and, and, and put these things, put the banking system in receivership and write off the hedge funds, not okay, the great. Social Thank Security. You. So the question is uh, really, just, just not to get into the, the, to the graphics of it, but how do you really deal with this issue? And I'm going to piggyback on this interesting question because one of the things that comes to mind with anybody that was watching what was going on in the 90s with the Japanese banking crisis and non-performing loans, you could regularly hear, and Gary, you may have been, been involved with this since... Uh, Larry Summers and Bob Rubin were, were pretty much pounding on the Japanese to get rid of their non-performing loan problem as quickly as possible. It's hard for me to see how this isn't another non-performing loan problem in the United States where the issue is not necessarily just people in their homes and foreclosures. 
It's, it's the heart attack that has been caused by the uncertainty between financial institutions wondering what bad debt is lurking out there, hidden from view, uh, and how you deal with that, which brings us into this gentleman's question of what is, do, do you continue to subsidize that? Do you continue to take a very harsh measure, or do you, do you basically reorganize? So um, I'd be happy to hear from anyone who'd, who'd like to take that. Austin? Okay, I would say three things. One, uh, there's no doubt that Steve's uh, issue of openness and transparency has been a humongous problem. Senator Obama went to NASDAQ back in September um, and said to Wall Street, look, I love capital markets and they're the most efficient markets that we have and capital markets can't function well without public trust and without openness, disclosure and transparency. And all of these issues about sieves and stuff that's not on the balance sheet and now we're finding out, oh, well you held this and what does it mean and maybe there's an extra hundred billion sitting around of, of, of losses that haven't been recognized. That is a very serious issue. When If we can't trust the rating agencies where there have been these, there are more than allegations, there is, is the suspicion that there are some conflicts of interest that have taken place in the, in the rating agencies. I mean, this, this is really, really problematic and it's not anti-business and it's not anti-market to say we need sound regulatory oversight of financial markets. That's just a, um, that is a really fundamental given that we must have um, if there's to be trust. Second, I would say uh, one of the puzzles for me when I first started looking at this thing is if you look at the losses on mortgages, I'm not saying they aren't large. They are large. 200 to 400 billion dollars is a big number. But compared to the size of the economy, compared to the size of the credit market, it isn't that big of a number. So that, that would be a tough hit. Somebody's going to lose their job, but nobody would be talking about the collapse of, the, of credit uh, for something that size. The thing that made this so much bigger is that everything is hugely leveraged. Okay, so two to four hundred billion dollars is getting magnified up because this thing is so leveraged. I believe that makes the what has been the hallmark of the democratic proposals, important that we start with the homeowners and the borrowers because for the same reason that the losses get magnified up in the credit market, if you addressed the concerns of the homeowners so that those losses were going to be smaller, a larger share of people could actually make their payments, the benefits of that also get magnified up uh, for the same reason because you're shrinking the losses and the not to go back to algebra, but you know, you, you multiply a bigger negative number, et cetera. Um, and then the third thing I would say is the, I do think we want to resist a little bit the temptation to overreact and say, okay, we're either going to have a massive RTC style bailout right away, or we're going to print money in Weimar Germany like, like they did in Weimar Germany, or have a dictatorship as in Mussolini. Those don't say, those, those three, let, let's make those the choices of last resort, I would say, in response to the question. So, look, we have faced severe credit crunches in the past uh, and not had collapses of the economy. And I believe that it is conceivable that we do that uh, now, and, and we ought to pursue those bailing out financial institutions uh, a, it's expensive. <laughs> B, you always got to worry about the issues of moral hazard and rewarding people for, for engaging in bad behavior, and it really ought to be the last resort. Thank you. Leo? Let me just amplify briefly on that. I, I think this gentleman is, 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 is really quite apt in, in, in how he poses it. This is not a poor person's problem. Uh, there is a minimum of $800 billion of, of high-risk, at-risk debts that have to be addressed, of which a little over $100 billion has been recognized within the system to date. What happened in Europe and Asia is I think they understand the denominator better than we do. We, we've been focusing on the numerator, so to speak. The $100 billion of recognized losses is, is, a, is, is a modest amount of the total degree of concern here. This is a massive credit crisis. It is, there has been an irresponsible Fed, an irresponsible regulatory environment that has allowed this to happen. It's far past transparency. It's been benign neglect. 
And if you, you, you have caused a, a phenomenal credit crisis here, you cannot bail it out. But you have to understand what the magnitude of the problem is. And I believe the Europeans and the Asians are more astute, which is ironic, but they're more astute at understanding the magnitude of the credit crisis that's confronting the United States. And that credit crisis is transcendent. It, it is a credit crisis around a, de a, a trade deficit, a current account deficit, a federal deficit, state deficits, consumer deficits, and corporate deficits. The magnitude is quite overwhelming. And it's because we have had a, a quarter century of really quite benign neglect as we have let our capital markets consolidate and we have, and we have let capital influences consolidate our regulatory responses have been benign and neglectful in reacting to that as they have been in our trade practices. Trade is debt. The current account is debt. And, and, and it, it is, it, it is, it, it's not tragic. It's, it's, it's criminal where, where we've gotten ourselves in, in this predicament. Uh, do, yeah, we can move on. Yeah. I, I just think it's a, well, it's a very important question. And, and I think that it, it's a, important to note the difference between the U.S. response uh, in this episode, or the U.S. capital market response, and that in Japan. That, that the good news in, in the U.S. is that uh, a lot of bad news is coming out on the table right now, uh, where if you look at the bad debt problem in Japan, and you think back to what, what Larry and, and Bob were trying to get the Japanese to do, it was really a big game of subterfuge to try to keep the banks going by, by hiding uh, the, the bad problems and, and by you know, keeping interest rates low enough so that it was easy to stay afloat even though your balance sheet was, was a disaster. And, and so, so there's a lot of pain right now. And, but that, that pain is, is happening because stuff is being put out and people are taking their lumps. And that's really a precondition uh, for, for getting going again. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, what, what's going to happen to, to, you know, when we start to see, see the turnaround is going to be government policy related, really. Uh, certainly not if you look at the climate right now. That I agree that, 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 that uh, just raining cash down, which is, it seems like what Congress wants to do, is not really going to have much of an effect. In fact, it's analogous to what the Japanese did when in response to their banking crisis, they kept building bridges and highways and trying different uh, stimulus, short-term stimulus programs to fix it when they had a, had a long-run problem. And, and so I think Senator McCain uh, recognizes right now that, that uh, the financial thing is going to work itself out uh, as people put their losses on the table and then is focused on, on long, longer-run solutions. Could Mr. Gensler, on Could the me? FDR option, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I've got to set a rule. I'm okay. sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I, I, I was just more going to respond uh, to yeah. my uh, friend Kevin here is that um, in terms of what Senator Clinton has put out, it's really to help uh, Americans, not to help out the institutions. So she and actually some of the other Democrats went to Wall Street and said, no, you have to be part of the solution and help fix it. Uh, and they're all for greater transparency, uh, not just raining dollars down, but really helping uh, middle-income Americans out. Uh, and I think even the chairman of the Federal Reserve uh, uh, has said that he thinks there's a need for fiscal stimulus. Just as a stimulus. quick follow-up, does that, I mean, I, I heard uh, Hillary Clinton in the debates the other night, and, and there are parts of her plan, given the fact that so many people watched this balloon and this bubble build, and thus are complicit, I can forgive to some degree those who might want to keep the bubble going a little while longer so that people can sort out their situation beyond this sort of initial shock. But I guess my, my question to you is, how do you deal with the, with the concern then about just real inefficient? I mean, there is an economic side of this where you get very inefficient distribution of capital if you meddle too much. And I guess I don't want folks to answer right now, but another question. I was reading a, a piece by a woman named Dorothy Robine, another former Clinton administration official, about the, um, uh, the, the airplane industry and essentially air traffic control. And it's a very interesting metaphor for thinking about our financial regulatory system. Have we moved? It's one thing to say that we need more regulation and we need more oversight. Uh, we also need better air traffic control, and you see what's going on in, the, in the, uh, the innovation in the airline industry is not being matched by innovation in the regulatory regime. And whether we have that at a more macroeconomic level, too, which is a real mismatch between government oversight <coughs> and regulation, and just, just not understanding the new contours of all the uh, interesting derivatives, the innovations in the financial sector, and, and how 
over time a, a new administration deals with that gap, if, if in fact there is one. So I don't want to ask our, our uh, response to that. I'll give Gary a few moments here, but then I'd like to move to Chris Guha and then open the floor. Well, and let's move more expeditiously if we can. Through the, through the I would say that uh, Senator Clinton views it as uh, important to work out of this uh, situation, these short-term challenges for homeowners. And just as we have for mm -hmm. over 200 years had a sense that we help corporations work through their problems and call it, you know, through bankruptcy and so forth, uh, because there are uh, related effects to the community, to the employers, the customers, to the vendors. Uh, there are related effects when homeowners have their homes taken away. I mean, dramatic effects to communities, <coughs> lower values in those communities, uh, and, 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 and cause uh, other social ills in those communities. So she views it as a positive to help individuals work their way through this. At the same time, making sure that there's full transparency at the banks, that the, the loans, if appropriately, need to be written down and so forth. So not anything like what's happening in Japan on the institutional side, but a real need to work through this for the individuals, not only for the individuals, but for the greater communities and economy around it. Thank you. Uh, let me ask Krishna Guha of Financial Times. If you'll speak loudly. Sure, you yeah. can even speak here so I don't have to repeat it. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to ask a question about how the various candidates see the role of the Federal Reserve, both in the build-up to the, the credit and housing crisis and its handling of monetary policy since the, the crisis broke back in August of last year. Both a sense of um, you know, how, how do you evaluate the, the, the role that the Fed has played in, in the genesis, perhaps, and also in the handling of this crisis. And secondly, whether you think that, that it, in terms of structural longer-term remedies, there is a case for revisiting the, the Fed's role, for instance, in consumer protection issues around mortgages. Some people believe that the Fed isn't the best agency to be handling these sort of retail consumer protection issues. It should be focused more on the macro questions and let some other agency deal with looking after the little guy. But uh, I'd just be interested in your thoughts. Thank you, Leo. Uh, I think I think it's a, it's an important question. Uh, I think if you read Alan Greenspan's book uh, in comments, uh, he's like a reformed smoker. He, he sort of knew it was killing him, but now he only admits it. Uh, you know, it's the Fed is not the agency uh, to address the sort of regulatory oversight that John Edwards believes is is is, a, is important but it is a reflective of where we've gotten ourselves, which is nobody is doing it. Uh, the, the lending agencies, the lending regulatory authorities have certainly not done it. And, and I think that the question is an important one. And again, I, I keep coming back that this is not a subprime problem. It, it is so unfair to, to watch national <coughs> pundits try to say that this was brought on by irresponsible poor people. It was brought on by irresponsible lenders. At, at most, 7% of the subprime crisis could be characterized as speculative. At most, about 7%. 93% of this was genuinely undertaken uh, by individuals in the belief that they were doing the right thing for themselves and their families. But it is not a subprime problem. It is a pervasive consumer debt problem. Able people in this town have looked back over this last six or seven years and, and have informed us that against roughly $4 trillion of GDP growth in absolute terms, we as a nation have seen consumer indebtedness rise roughly $7 trillion in that period of time. We've seen federal indebtedness without a proper accounting for this war rise roughly $4 trillion. We, we, have, we, have, we have sucked on the teat of, of debt for a decade now, and this is the consequence. It comes back to my earlier comment, Steve, and again, it, it's fundamental. What part of this report card do we like? And we must institutionally reform the, these, these <laughs> agencies and these authorities. I don't think the Fed is the answer, Steve, but I think the Fed uh, is, is showing what happens when you don't do it well. It's not monetary policy. Any other responses? I would say three things about that. Well, I'll cut it to two, because okay. you want them to be brief. One, let's get at the outset. The independence of the Fed is extremely important. Senator Obama always says it's not the place of any of the presidential candidates, or of the president, for that matter, to be saying, well, the Fed ought to be doing this and that, and they change the interest rate incorrectly. Um, that's different from the regulatory role of the Fed. 
Okay, the, the independence on monetary policy is extremely important. I, I believe everyone has a duty, not just the, the ability to comment on it when they do not think that uh, regulatory bodies are overseeing uh, in, in a sufficient manner uh, what's going on. Now, Ben Bernanke, as you probably know, was an academic. And uh, many, if not most, of my <laughs> monetary and macro <laughs> colleagues, which I, uh, which I am not one, they look at they look have looked at Ben Bernanke and thought in their minds, in the back of their mind, why not me? Why why are not? And I have noticed in the last two months, thank God it has been me. more. Yeah, thank God it's him. It has been more their attitude. Look, the Fed is in a very difficult spot. And Ben Bernanke's in a very difficult spot. A, all of this stuff is left over. It's obvious Ben Bernanke wasn't doing it. It didn't get us into these problems. Inflation is already above the Fed's target. Um, the dollar is already down. In the face of slowing, the Fed would normally say, OK, let's cut the interest rate. But you know, if we start cutting rates and the world holds their rates the same, the dollar is going to go down farther. There are these implications for inflation. So it's not an. It, it's not an easy job that the Fed has, um, but I do think that the, the the reduction in the influence that the Fed, you, we have seen over the last several months in stark re reality, the Fed does not control events or even the interest rate in a way that at one time it, it clearly did. Okay, so the the U.S. is smaller in the world capital market than than it has been in a long time. And um, and so all of those things mean the federal government's role, I think, it, it, there is a role to play. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to the to the standing crowd for a moment. Steve, do you have a question? No? Uh, this gentleman here, I think it's Philippe. Yes, Philippe? I can hear you. You don't need to come in. Thank you. <laughs> Every time we have a crisis, income polarization in the U.S. worsens. Our gene gets spread because most one of the top has a bottom for their losses and the sky's the limit for their profits, while the middle class and the poor class get left out. So every crisis that comes in, we have a bigger spread of, of income. I hope those elements are taken into account. We don't need a more polarized society. The Conference of Majors last November make a long list of why our citizen crisis and among the steps needed are things that will have an, in, an immediate stimulus in the economy. And, uh, reducing the employment tax to the employers, more food stamp for families that do not qualify, extending unemployment mm -hmm. benefits, things that can be done immediately. What I am concerned is that most of the stimulus that we are talking about will not be felt until next December, even the mechanics of even printing checks and distributing them. Have you addressed the, time, the, time of, the timing of the stimulus? Philippe is with Millennium Challenge Corporation. Thank you very much for uh, the question, which I, I'm going to butcher for a moment. Um, uh, the real question is looking at what the contours of a potential stimulus had that the, that the Conference of Mayors had proposed, sort of food, food stamps, uh, payroll tax uh, uh, adjustments, et cetera, various sort of tax adjustments. But this raises a second question, which I would like uh, also to be to, to piggyback which is on, on the nature of, of, of stimulus. There seems to me to be a kind of stimulus that chugs a lot more money and cash into an economy. There's another kind of discussion that we've had, which is can you use a moment when you're doing that to, to begin addressing some of the fundamental infrastructure challenges in the country where you both get a bang, but you're also sort of reinvigorating and recreating American infrastructure, on the, the foundation on which so much other stuff happens. And uh, Barack Obama's talked a little bit about broadband. Hillary Clinton has talked about bridges and schools. But, but to some degree, is there a fundamental difference that we should be making between, uh, I remember when Clyde Prestowitz was talking to a government official once, he says, I don't care if it's a semiconductor chip we're talking about or a potato chip, it's all the same. Is it all the same? Is a fiscal stimulus approach all the same? Or do you get different multipliers in the long-term health of an economy depending on how you shape your stimulus package? Gary? Well. I think to Senator Clinton, uh, and, and in, in some of the internal debate on this, it was absolutely critical that it, it go fast. And though she has very bold and comprehensive long-term 
uh, strategies around health care and infrastructure, as you said, and energy, that this was a time to address something that would get out quickly. So in the $110 billion package, the aggregate package, um, there's a component that's a quick rebates, about $40 billion. There's about $25 billion that's around energy, $650 on average for about 40 million uh, families. Uh, there's $10 billion dollars of more unemployment insurance. I think probably very similar. I don't know the contours, but I think very similar to what the conference put out. Um, and then there is a component of about $30 billion related to housing. Um, uh, some of it for counseling, which would be a little slower. Uh, some of it directly to the states to, for the states to decide how to use that assistance and put it out. Um, and so, uh, it, it was really the goal, get it out, but get it out around these three big issues of housing, uh, energy, and, and jobs. Thank you. Kevin? Yes, sir. Uh, the, for, first, I, I think that the, in this computer age, government has gotten a lot better at whatever it does, making it happen quickly. Uh, and, and I would think that even if, if the compromise bill uh, that looks like is cooking right now were, were to be the solution chosen, that one could expect that it would begin to have influence maybe by April or May. Uh, and, and that might not be as soon as, soon as you might like, but it's, it's pretty darn soon. Um, I could say that if you want to have an immediate effect, uh, there, there's a long history uh, in uh, stimulus package land of uh, having business measures uh, retroactive to some day. I have not quite seen uh, that statement yet, but, but for example, if, if, uh, if they were to pursue Senator McCain's approach, and cut the corporate rate, or if they're going to pursue the kind of thing I've been hearing whispers about, having uh, expensing or partial expensing for firms, if they said uh, that that will be effective January 1, uh, then firms would go out right away and start taking advantage of the tax benefit that they would get if they uh, invested in, in America. Uh, that, uh, in fact, was what happened back, uh, back after 9-11. Uh, in the uh, House, uh, I think it was Bill Thomas, uh, Ways and Means Committee chairman, said, and, and everyone agreed, that whatever it is they ultimately pass, uh, to expand expensing would be retroactive to 9-11, and, and you saw a surge uh, in, in equipment uh, purchases uh, documented by Matt, Matt Shapiro at the University of Michigan uh, began, began after that statement was made before the bill was even passed. And, and so there are, there are measures that people can take uh, to make uh, things uh, uh, happen quickly. The one thing I would add, though, is that, that, that I don't think that, that it's necessarily the right approach uh, to, to, to follow the path that, that Gary and my other friends up here uh, want to follow, because really what they're doing is they're moving taxes all the heck over the place in order to, to, to address this, this short-term uh, problem over the next few years. Think about it, that, that the idea would be to put in a, a stimulus package now, let that expire next year, wait a year, and then hike a whole bunch of taxes. And that, that, that kind of just doesn't seem to me like a step in the direction of, of where we need to be in the long run, which is something that we could take this year uh, and, and, and indeed uh, each subsequent year as well. Any other comments? Well, I, I just uh, no, the kind of I would just I, I was just noting that in the 1990s, 22 million Americans, uh, more jobs were created and we did have rates which uh, I think on the Democratic side uh, we would say for those earning over $250,000 it would be appropriate to go back to and we still had great economy. And I would just say, if, you're, if your thing is speed of the stimulus getting out, you're going to want for, to vote for Senator Obama. That, that is the, that's why his that's plan why was made, right? right? Yes, he got, he, he's, more than 90 percent of the money could get out in the first three months, which is very different. This is a reference yeah. to a Ruth Marcus article today in the Washington Post that I haven't read yet. But, you know, again, my question is how much of it sticks over time. So, uh, oh, right here back to CNN. Hey, Baldwin, with CNN. As just piggybacking off that question, talk about your stimulus packages, but if your candidate were president today, what aspect of the stimulus package would you push them on to put in place that could realistically jumpstart the economy quickly? The question was, which part of the uh, stimulus package would your would your candidate uh, uh, put forward that would, would very quickly or immediately jumpstart the economy? What's the silver bullet? Is there a silver bullet? You know, I think there are, there are two silver bullets. One is actually health care, which, which doesn't get characterized as stimulus, but it, it's the single largest tax on the American business economy that there is in, in today. It's been that, that way for two decades. 
uh, uh, some reformation of health care. It may be as, as, as John Edwards has detailed or, or as Senator McCain has put forward. That would be very stimulating to this economy. The other piece of immediacy is all of our candidates have been talking about the green economy. What does that really mean? For some of our candidates, John Edwards, it means a lot of job stimulus, jobs that would be created quickly. Uh, one aspect of his current immediate stimulus plan would be to take resources of the federal government and put it into, into home heating, insulation, things of that sort, where you would see those dollars come into the economy. One of the points of, of your question that's important, uh, the credit crisis, and I, I hate coming back to it so regularly, but it's so acute that putting a modest amount of, of financial resource into many of these individuals' hands will simply go against their credit card indebtedness or their, or their, or their missed mortgage payment. There has to be a distinction drawn between stimulus that gets spent as contrasted with stimulus that pays down briefly uh, a, a, an immediate credit crisis. So I, I think it's somewhere in that amalgam of, of green, of energy, and of health care. Th those would be the, the January 09 immediate hits. And, 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 the, and they're reflected, I think, in, in, in certainly in John Edwards' immediate stimulus plan as well. Thank you. Austin? I, I would just say that all of those issues are important energy is important, health care is important, and none of those are stimulus. And that's the point. In Senator Obama's stimulus plan, the point is you've got to get the money. The whole criticism of fiscal stimulus by people who believe, there are many people who don't believe we should ever do fiscal stimulus, we should always rely on the Fed. And that's because they say the federal government is never able to get the money out the door in time. So by the time they get it out the door, the recovery has already begun and it actually makes inflation worse. The typical recession, on average, since World War II has lasted 11 months. So if they declare that the recession began in the fourth quarter of, of 07, uh, you've got to get the money out right away. Now, in Senator Obama's view, the evidence shows that immediate tax rebates for the payroll tax to low and middle income people and topping up Social Security payments, which 90% of the Social Security payments are direct deposited, so if we pass this law, they could literally put the money out tonight. Uh, those are the ways to get money into the economy right away. But All of the question you was send about January 09. No, her question was what would have an immediate impact. No. So before January 09 is when the next president would come in office. But my issue is if we are to go into recession. It has to be well before January 09 that we address this problem. Because by January 09, there are many people who say that that problem would be over. We would be growing again. So it's got to be right now. And when you need stimulus right now, you cut checks. You don't send applications. You don't call for tax credits that would be on your tax form in April of 2009. You would get the rebate. Or home heating assistance is important but not for next winter that has to be evaluated by, by a federal regulator in a 10-page application, which is what the current programs are. you got to get the money out the door in a way that people can use, and they don't have to know that they have to apply for the money, and that's the centerpiece There's, of Obama's Gary Gary Gansler wants to jump on this, and I know Kevin will have uh, uh, well, some thoughts. I think just to your question, uh, I don't need to speak to it because Senator Clinton has. She said if she were president now, she'd have a $110 billion program, and, and she's laid it out. And just uh, though we're having some uh, a lively debate here, in her program, $40 billion would be immediate uh, uh, tax rebates. I believe that Senator Obama's was $45 billion. Seven. Uh, <laughs> well, unless you've raised it now. No, there's two. There's 35. Okay, right. but, 35. Um, uh, um, in terms of put it all on the website later. Yeah. <laughs> in terms in terms of the energy assistance, uh, uh, states uh, don't need to wait until next winter. They can do it right now, uh, and and they can put that assistance out. Uh, it's a 12-month program, and they can do it without the uh, applications that uh, Austin re referred to. And then on housing. Uh, she does think this is critical uh, to put money out there. We recognize that some of that, particularly like for, for counseling, takes a little bit longer, but she believes when she's around this country that is a critical thing that Americans are talking about. 
part of it also goes directly for states, and states can put that money out as they see fit. Kevin? Uh, there, there is a long, long history of, of stimulus packages that go, going back at least to uh, President Kennedy. And, and really, the literature had concluded uh, up until the last one uh, that they pretty much don't work. And the last one, however, there were some, some papers, uh, a very influential paper by uh, Jonathan Parker and co-authors that, that found that the, the stimulus package did work when they mailed money to people. They did spend it. But uh, it might well be, although economists don't really know, that the reason why this is the only one that really worked uh, is, is that it, it was associated with a permanent tax cut. Uh, all the previous ones, the temporary uh, rebates and so on, it, it had much more miserable uh, experience and were much, much less effective. I, I think I'm very concerned uh, that, uh, that people have learned uh, right now as they're making their poli policy prescriptions from the last episode where we had what were viewed as permanent or at least long-lasting tax cuts uh, and, and then the checks were mailed out and then people consumed from them. Uh, that that means that if we have a temporary one, that they'll do so uh, as well. And, and I think it's much more prudent uh, to, to take a step to make firms more competitive in, in the world marketplace. Uh, to, if you announce today uh, that you're going to do that, then firms will begin responding today. They don't have to wait for checks to be mailed. Uh, that's what I, what I would emphasize uh, in response to your question. Kevin, quick, quick follow-up. Uh, John McCain, when he was chairman of the Commerce Committee, spoke for New America uh, a good a good half dozen times. I mean, he's, he's been here many, many times. And he's talked a lot about technology, a lot about competition in the telecom sector, a lot about broadband. He's been very actively involved in the question of, of wireless spectrum. But in this campaign, I haven't heard much, and I don't know it's be, whether it's because he hasn't been addressing those issues or whether it's not been getting through in the media giving other issues. But I'm, I'm interested, do you believe, or and, and does the McCain campaign believe that the kind of uh, broadband infrastructure, telecom infrastructure, sort of next-gen uh, technology issues, uh, which some of the other candidates have been have been talking about recently, is an important feature of an economic uh, strategy. Oh, oh absolutely, and, and uh, Senator McCain has a long uh, track record on this at, at Commerce Committee. I, I think that uh, the the difference maybe between Senator McCain and, and some of the candidates represented here is that, that he believes that, that what we need to do is, is just make sure that, that government gets out of the way and let the infrastructure infrastructure happen without, without the tying lot, lots of uh, tying, tying firms in knots with lots of regulations. And, and so, so this hasn't been a hot issue in this campaign, I think, because in part because uh, at the beginning, the Iraq war was the hot issue in the campaign. And, and now with the economy uh, turning sour, it's that. And, and, and so, so abs absolutely, uh, there, there are lots of things that can be done in telecom regulation, and, and I'm sure that, that you know, if, when, once the economy settled down, that that would be an area he would right. It's just interesting, as I just know that uh, Barack Obama the other night was the only person to mention the word broadband, and it's it's interesting how off the radar screen uh, that is, so to speak. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, Nadia Chao with the Liberty Time from Taiwan. Uh, while, you know, many Asian countries react to the stock markets falling uh, in panic, many people are just doubting, are, are, is the U.S. just facing a recession or depression? I mean, for any of the candidates, is there a reason that why people have to worry about depression? <laughs> It, this, this very good question is uh, uh, really looking at the Asian markets and the global markets as a whole, um, wondering whether the United States is facing just a recession or a depression. Uh, and, and I might, again, uh, editorialize, just, just add, add a, a, a piece to this, which I'd love to hear from the candidates. Larry Summers used to say that the U.S. economy or the global economy was flying on one engine, meaning the U.S. economy. And the question is whether that's still true today. What will drive growth. For a long time it has been uh, perceived that the U.S. consumer has been driving global growth. What will, glo what will the contours of global growth look like in American growth uh, over time, and, and particularly if U.S. consumers are taking a rest? Kevin? Oh, well, yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that, that, again, we could think of there being two worlds. One, one world where, where the U.S. is growing uh, very quickly and the rest of the world isn't. Uh, and that, that was kind of what we saw in the 90s a lot. Uh, and, and then another world where, where uh, a lot of countries are, are catching up to, to uh, the, the developed countries very, very, very rapidly. I think that the convergence uh, towards sort of the, a modern, rich economy that we're seeing throughout Asia in particular it is, is a terrifically optimistic sign uh, that for the future that, that the uh, U.S. doesn't have to be the only engine driving the world economy. 
uh, it's good news whenever everybody else uh, gets gets rich, a and it provides a, a backdrop uh, for the for the U.S. to succeed, as as we see now is happening, as, as our exports are going up a lot in response to, to the declining currency, uh, and so so I think that that uh, whether we have a de depression or not, I, I think it, it's really. Uh, in so, somewhat in, in the, the hands of uh, the candidates uh, and, and their policies. The, Do you think the, a declining currency is good? Oh, I, I, I don't, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I think that the, uh, the, the, the currency declines very often when the economy turns sour and, and, and exports go up and then that, that helps equilibrate it. I think it's, it's good when prices so are allowed to, on that, prices that are allowed to adjust. Yeah. It's a good thing. Uh, but, but, I, but I do think, though, that, that if, we, if we don't really think seriously about the long-run challenges facing our country, that we could have uh, an extended recession or we could have a recession and then a little break and another one because uh, the, the amount of, of tax hike uh, that is on the horizon if we don't make changes, uh, fundamental changes to our policies is just extraordinary. We have to double the size of government. If we try to double the size of government over the next couple of decades, uh, then we could have a very extended period of very, very low growth. Any other reactions? Let me take other questions. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Uh, Jim Scholar, I, I represent uh, uh, a number of domestic manufacturers in Washington that uh, are trying to produce their products here in this country, but they're being driven offshore or out of business by a dysfunctional trade policy. Uh, so the question, I, we don't have time for statements, so I need a question. And yet they don't hear this issue being addressed in the campaigns, in the debates uh, that the candidates have with the exception of, I think, uh, Senator Edwards, and some occasional mention by the other candidates. But uh, this is so much connected to the, the jobs issue, the health care problem, the mortgage <coughs> the People don't have jobs. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thank you for that. Why, why is yeah. that? Is this a third rail of Right. America so the question, a very good question, is, is really about trade. I think Leo Henry mentioned uh, the current account deficit, which I think there are two features in the international uh, economic system that are fundamentally different than uh, uh, really 97, 98. One is the massive eruption of the current account deficit, and the second is the growth of sovereign wealth funds, which we haven't talked about, which are largely in response to some of those shocks. But, but how does it get impacted upon manufacturing in America, the whole manufacturing question, high-wage jobs in the United States, and can there be a strategy that takes us forward economically that doesn't really squarely and comprehensively look at the other dimensions of, of, of uh, what's going on internationally. And, and you know, when I look at a current down deficit, I don't necessarily call it debt, I just call it constrained options. And so I'm wondering how, how others uh, here think about that issue. Gary? Well, uh, Senator Clinton's very much uh, an internationalist. Uh, we are part of a global world. Uh, whatever one's definition of globalization, it is here and it's part of the fabric of, 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 of the world and what we're dealing with. On trade, though, she, she has stated she believes in smart trade is the word she uses, but that it's not really worked for all Americans. Back again to how she, what she's heard on the campaign trail, listening to people, uh, thinking about the needs of middle-income Americans. She believes that we should uh, uh, look at every trade <laughs> agreement that we've entered into, and for years mm -hmm. she's felt this, uh, that we should look at every trade agreement and just make sure it's working for America. You know, we have an administration right now that I think has brought, if I'm right, only 16 trade enforcement actions in seven years. Uh, that's about as much as the prior president, President Clinton, brought in any one year. I mean, if we're going to enter into agreements, we ought to enforce them, we ought to fight for them, and Senator Clinton has been strong about uh, adding enforcement to our trade agreements, making sure that Yes, we address uh, labor and environmental standards, uh, as was the case in this recent one trade agreement with Peru, uh, that it's equally enforceable uh, alongside the commercial arrangements, uh, but that we do assess where we are in all these trade agreements at least uh, every three years after they're entered into and every five years thereafter, uh, which is what she has also said that we should do if she were to become president in, in uh, uh, January of 2009, and just take a moment to look at how they're working for Americans and make sure as we move forward, yes, with smart trade, but move forward to make sure it works for Americans. Austin, do you have a comment? This always puts me in the I'm the, an economist. The, the University and of the Chicago economy, part. Yeah, the economist. <laughs> nobody's ever going to be more in favor of open markets and free trade than the economist. Um, and so then you would presume that I would say, oh, we should be for everything that has the words free trade agreement in it. 
And all I will tell you is this. I, I do believe that there is nobody <coughs> who's more in favor of open markets than me. And that said, if you look at the free trade agreement, if you have never read a free trade agreement, I, I encourage you to go read it. Uh, because it is as close to the economist case for free trade as our tax code is to the economist case for the ideal tax system. Okay, if you look at these 900 page agreements, there are two pages of what every economist would say, yeah, that's great. They're opening, you know, lowering tariff barriers, and it's 898 pages of loopholes. It looks just like the tax code of this and protect this company and make sure that they, they're getting their money uh, and these investor protections. And so I think that the case for open markets is different from what do you think about this, that, or the 146 trade agreements that were signed in the 1990s. And Obama has been trying to get us away from what I call the false choice, that either you're for every single thing that the administration has done, um, or else you're a protectionist and you're against America's role in the international economy. Neither of those are true. There are, there are perfectly grounded uh, things oriented around opening markets and expanding our presence in the world that I think we can have pretty general consensus on. And, and I agree with Gary, one thing that we should have general consensus on is if a country signs a, an agreement with the United States that says they're going to do A, B, and C, that they should do it. And if they don't do it, we should pursue the means in the WTO or otherwise that make sure everybody abides by the agreements they sign. Uh, so it strikes me that th th there is common ground here. Kevin? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the trade area is one uh, where you, you need to be very, very careful uh, uh, allowing uh, thoughts like smart trade uh, to, to leak in because uh, there are so many uh, politically important uh, interests uh, that are opposed to free trade. And uh, the fact is that, that free, free trade benefits uh, millions and millions of Americans a little bit at a time and harms uh, you know big money interests like like a specific textile mill uh, or you can give a lot of other examples a sugar company uh, uh, it, 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 in a very very focused way and and so that there are always parochial interests opposed to trade that can be very very politically important and uh, S Senator McCain is just an unabashed free trader um, I think he, he agrees with, with Austin's analysis that it would be better if our free trade agreements moved towards being a couple pages rather than, than 900. Uh, but but uh, I've, I've found um, uh, on, during this campaign uh, the discussion of trade as sort of the, the most disturbing for me as, as an economist, not speaking for the cam campaign, looking from the outside. I, I thought that, that the part of President Clinton's record that, that I respect the most uh, from his time in the White House was his trade record uh, and, and his very aggressive pursuit of, of free trade. And, and it seems to me uh, that, that all the Democratic candidates, but especially Mrs. Clinton, have really kind of apologized uh, for that record when, when the right thing to do for all the little guys out there who benefit from free trade is to, is to celebrate it. I want to go to, to, to Leo and then and Gary, but I want to uh, uh, ask Kevin, uh, after we get it launched, I hope you'll come back and speak for our Smart Globalization Initiative uh, here at New America. <laughs> you can chat with us about our views, but uh, Leo? You know, just on this issue, I, 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 actually Senator Edwards was the individual who coined the phrase smart trade. I'm, I'm sorry that, that Kevin seems to be for unsmart trade, but the... Just, just uh, trade. Uh, just uh, trade. I, I think, and, and just, just four themes that... Blue label that, trade, right? Four <laughs> themes that I, I think are imperative to, to this gentleman's question. One is we, we've got to realize that one size does not fit all in trade policy. And, and, and that's fundamental. It, 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 you can't understand why we fail to recognize it. But to characterize our trade policies in, in trying to put everything under the same umbrella is, is foolishness and dangerous. We also have to, uh, Steve, be much more sensitive to the area of subsidy of currency manipulation and, and obviously enforcement. I think Austin's point is one we've made continually that enforce. But uh, fair trade is not anti-free trade. And, and I, I don't understand why we cannot have thoughtful debates uh, with our colleagues on the other side about unfairness. 
subsidies are unfair, currency manipulation is unfair, trying to find least common denominators in our trade policies as opposed to abandoning this one-size-fits-all approach and then enforcing the hell out of our agreements is, is not unfair. It, it's quite the opposite, it, and certainly it is not anti-free trade. Thank you. Sure. I, I, just briefly, I yeah. think that uh, uh, with Kevin's little hit there, um, Senator Clinton. I think it was a friendly. <laughs> it was, an it was a friendly, friendly. Yeah. But I mean, Senator. You from when you were there before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Senator Clinton is very much, as I said, an internationalist. Uh, but she does feel, in in public conversation and private conversation, the trade has not fulfilled all of the uh, uh, desires or hopes or even promises that economists and, and sometimes uh, the public uh, thinks of it, and that we have to have a look at it. We have to un understand how do we make this work best in a 21st century economy? How do we enforce these agreements? Um, I would n note, as she has noted, back in 93 or so when trade agreements were put in place, it was really uh, quite, a, quite an advance to have a side agreement that spoke to some environmental issues and some labor issues. Uh, that was at the forefront. Well. We've now just entered a new agreement uh, with Peru, this one example, where it's fully enforceable, it's comparable to the commercial arrangements. So, I mean, things have moved along in those 15 years, and so it makes sense to look at it in a new environment. We, we need to wrap up in about four minutes, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose one last question. I apologize. And if we can uh, stay below the cameras, that would be helpful. The, 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 the last question I want to ask is, is the United States today, just, just factually, is in, a, is, is in a very capital-dependent state, a very capital-hungry state. And as I mentioned, the Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, uh, is a very interesting new feature in the international financial world. Um, Hillary Clinton the other night mentioned financial institutions being able to get over their problems by rushing to Abu Dhabi. And I think what she was telegraphing in that is that you can have non-market behaviors or you can have... Uh, you know, non-market sensitivities built into, into your system. I don't know if I agree with that, but what I do agree with is, is the fact that sovereign wealth funds matter and our ability to dictate to other governments which may or may not have certain uh, uh, prerogatives and what they're trying to do with capital may in fact raise either sovereignty questions or just good governance questions on, on a whole variety of fronts. So I'm interested to what degree the, your campaign that you represent has thought this through. To what degree are you concerned about sovereign wealth funds in, given the context that we're in a capital hungry and a capital uh, 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 dependent situation today? Gary? Um, well, Senator Clinton, as you all well know, is, is very thoughtful and it seems that the memo started on this sometime last year and she spoke, I think, first to it in October, but I might be off on that. And and. There's about 2.4 trillion, some measures about three trillion dollars in sovereign wealth funds today, and they will grow dramatically, largely uh, around our trade deficit. Because if we're if we're bar if we're have a trade deficit of nearly a trillion dollars a year somewhere overseas, somebody's going to need to buy have have to finance that. Um, what she has said is this is part of a global capital markets and change, but we should have more transparency. And she's called upon. Uh, the IMF uh, to lead an effort uh, to uh, promote that transparency because these market actors, while they have many uh, uh, characteristics like private market actors, aren't entirely private market actors. They are controlled by governments and may from time to time take on different characteristics. And so it's important that we understand their investment uh, uh, goals, uh, their holdings. We know far less about most of these funds than we do on the standard mutual fund, for instance, mm -hmm. and far less uh, than we do even in uh, any, uh, you know, state pension fund and so forth. So uh, transparency, but uh, certainly there is a, a, a concern, and it goes back also fundamentally to our overall economic program that Hillary Clinton really thinks that we have to have a goal to energy independence, and we have to have a goal to really bring down the trade trade imbalances that we have and promote a greater savings rate here while at the same time try to promote that uh, uh, foreign countries, the Asian countries that have these massive saving rates start to spend as well. Thank you. Austin, do you have any thoughts on sovereign wealth funds in, in as a uh, I, I would say, remarks? look, the, if, the, the, first step, the first step is you say, well, you know, what did you think was going to happen to, to Gary's point of, right. 
if the price of oil is $100 a barrel, you know the people who export oil are going to be accumulating a lot of money. If you run gigantic imbalances uh, with developing countries, which as you say is a little strange, why is the U.S. borrowing from poor countries? Normally we would think it would go the other way. But as we do that, um, they're going to accumulate larger and larger amounts of reserves. And after a while, they're going to be tired of just investing in, in U.S. Treasuries. I would point out there's also the other, I mean, the, this, this has a downside on the other side, too, that we're nervous that they're investing their money in, in our companies, but we're also nervous that they're going to stop investing in our Treasuries and we're going to drive our interest rate way up. I mean, the root of the sovereign wealth fund issue is centered in a lot of the macro policies and uh, us falling down in what we should have been doing as we go along. Now that said, I totally agree with Gary, and I think there's widespread agreement among uh, among thoughtful people who look at this issue that we need better disclosure. There are certain industries where we're going to be mindful of a controlling stake from sovereign wealth funds because they relate to, to national security. It strikes me personally, not from the candidate, that if they're talking about taking small percentage investments or if it's being mediated through <coughs> U.S. hedge funds, that they're investing in hedge funds, whoever it is, that strikes me as less disturbing than, you know, some of these Thank things. Thank yeah, the so Sovereign wealth funds are, are uh, a potential national security issue. Uh, uh, it's something that, that uh, Senator McCain takes very seriously. You can think very bad things uh, that a, a rival uh, of the United States could do through their sovereign wealth funds. On the other hand, uh, if you know the U.S. is holding an auction and financial markets are in auction every day, if people show up, uh, more people show up who have money in their pockets, then, then the price uh, of the U.S. asset that's uh, sold is going to be higher. And, and so you don't want to close off your markets and violate trade agreements by doing that. And so it's an issue that deserves study. The, the, and, and Senator McCain's been thinking long and hard about it. I, I think that, that the, the thing that you have to recognize when you think about sovereign wealth funds is that sovereign wealth investors, unlike just about every other investor you can think of, are investors whose motives aren't necessarily clear. Uh, and uh, so, so a, uh, for example, a, a, a country, I don't want to pick on a specific country, could buy a, a, enough stock in a U.S. firm to influence management and then try to get management to locate plants in that country. Um, right. you, could, you could think of, of lots of things that they could do. And um, I, you know, I think that, that uh, because of that, uh, then disclosure, as Gary and, and, and Austin remarked, is very, very important because we need to be able to know, know well, well, you know, who owns the shares, what, you know, how are, how are the funds, uh, what are the funds purchasing, and how are they, they doing it? Are they doing it through private equity firms and, and so on? And, and so disclosure, disclosure, more disclosure is something that, that's clearly needed, but, but more study is needed as well. Um, so far, sovereign wealth funds haven't really been abusing, as far as we know, haven't been abusing that, that they haven't been very activist, in part perhaps because they're wary of, of new regulations that might occur uh, were they to do that. Uh, but we need to be careful not to let ourselves get into a situation where an enemy of the United States could have significant leverage over us because they because we were asleep at the wheel. So you see, let me put in a plug issue. for the New America Foundation. Doug and Heidi Rediger have done some great work on this. If, so if anybody's <coughs> really interested in that, you should right? Go we have a global strategic finance initiative uh, as well as a smart globalization initiative, which we're which we're on, and a fiscal responsibility initiative. So uh, we're trying to hit all the right uh, marks. But but last word to Leo Hendry. You know, I, I, I agree with, with Kevin, as does Senator Edwards, who spoke to this issue a year ago, that there are certain things we do as a society in our ports and transportation, our financial industries, and, and our what we call advanced technology products, where a policy, not a study, is imperative, and the policy should exist before any more of these investments are made. Uh, they're going to. You, you don't let them be made and then develop your reaction. You have a reaction and a policy. We called for one a year ago. This nation again is is so regulatory averse right now that now the the crises are hitting and the investments are being made and we're still saying maybe we should study this. Uh, Kevin is completely right as is Senator McCain. There are grave implications to all parts of our national and homeland security and our economic security that should have uh, elicited a, a policy by now. 
I just want to say that I think we've accomplished something truly astounding here in Washington in the middle of a silly season of campaigning, which is we've had a thoughtful, uh, deep discussion. I actually think that, that, that some of the proposals and initiatives have, have real uh, uh, newsworthiness uh, uh, that were made today. And I want to thank um, all of our panelists, Austin Goolsby, Leo Hendry, Kevin Hassett, Gary Gensler, uh, for joining us in really what I thought to be a superb discussion, which was with, without very much ideological uh, taint. And I, I'm grateful to all of you. I want to thank our audience. We'll be back to, as I said, New America Foundation and our Economic Growth Program, our next social contract initiative and our various other programs in the economic area. We're struggling with these issues. We're, we're trying to approach them uh, in a way that, that, is, that is open and to sort of think through the contours of these questions in a comprehensive way uh, about what drives us more towards high wage job creation in the United States and to think responsibility responsibly within a global context. So with that, please give our, uh, our, our panel a round of applause and uh, thank all of you for joining us. Thank you. Yeah,